Test. Welcome back. Chapter 4, Part 3. We're going to be looking into more of the internal structures and looking at the cytoskeleton. Now, it sounds like an extremely boring topic, uh, but it's really not. And let me try to convince you uh, what I'm saying. Okay, so here is surface attachment. So I want you to think about it in your mind. I don't worry about, yeah. I think about it in your mind that the membrane is this fluid mosaic. And now the question becomes, how can we anchor something in that fluid mosaic that isn't just going to pop out? In other words, docking or attachments or having it as a... Uh, a portal there's something like that well if you look at where the red is it, it's uh, straps these are a series of uh, circular fibers which is what we'll call it right now and here is in the yellow part is the port something that's floating in there but we want to have some strength so if we were to pull on it or uh, to try to move it these would constrain it and let me show you in detail here so you can see that strapping that webbing and what it's doing is giving it more surface area in addition to all the the lattice structure the uh, scaffolding that's going on inside the cell to keep it from getting compressed and that was part of the the movie that i had shown you uh prior so all of these things play interesting parts but the the big one is the uh, strapping now that that strapping that I showed you in the previous slide that, where the red arrow is you can think of it as that toggle bolt that you put in the wall you drill a hole and the, this toggle part will fold in as soon as it passes the hole in the wall you know the paper type walls that we have with the um, clay in between these will pop back out so what it's doing is that you can attach a, a large picture or something like that without it tearing through the wall because this open part here provides the extra uh, area to to get some support and so surface area here is really important and that'll hold your painting all day long and it's it, it follows just like that and so the types of things that the cells do, uh, we have uh, tight junctions, which uh, provides that nice tight seal between cells. And you know that uh, the infrastructure swells a little bit because your skin starts to wrinkle as you get uh, much uh, farther in uh, the time as far as your uh, skin's being soaking up water. Things expand and you see the wrinkling. And it has a lot to do with the infrastructure keeping uh, this doesn't expand as much as let's say the tissue does and hence you get the wrinkling. Desmosomes you can think of it as velcro but in order to hold in in place we have to have those uh, supports that I'm talking about and on the uh, inside of the membrane and isn't that a clever way nature does that and then here's the gap junctions and again these are held into place because if these moved around then it would be really hard from cell to cell to move things and to do what we need to do and all of these are supported by the electron micro microscopy that we we uh, we know about so plasma membranes part of that fluid mosaic uh, which has proteins and lipids and carbohydrates embedded in it. Uh, the proteins found in them, uh, like the portals and various things, uh, carry on the gatekeeping function that we talked about last time. And also receptors, molecules, and things that catalyze reactions, but also allowing transfer from cell to cell. And uh, how amazing is that? So I ended in conjunction with carbohydrates, proteins, uh, phospholipids that make up most of the plasma membrane. We also have cholesterol we had uh, just sort of talked about last time. And uh, the most uh, common fatal inherited disease 
uh, in, the, in the United States is cystic fibrosis. And this is from just one aspect of a gateway that doesn't function properly, a sodium pump. And uh, it's, of course, it's part of the membrane. And there's about 30,000 people in the United States that have cystic, cystic fibrosis. And what happens is the mucus, without that sodium pump doesn't get the proper amount of uh, water and the mucus thickens and you say well what's the big deal well when you have billions of these uh, types of sodium pumps that don't work properly then the mucus becomes an issue it's too thick and that uh, doesn't allow things to get in and out of the cell because it's like sticky gum and this faulty membrane uh, can be seen in heart disease uh, diabetes and other hormonal disorders so improper functioning of receptors and transport mechanisms just because of some of the membrane uh, uh, problems uh, man it, does, it really illustrates how important uh, the membranes are so pharmaceutical drugs can alter membrane function uh, stressful situations adrenal glands pump out adrenaline and we know about that when you're about to take an exam or something and you start to sweat and um, you uh, feel nervous, anxiety goes up. And it has a lot to do uh, with perceptions. So adrenaline, a fight or flight chemical, cannot enter the cell when a beta blocking medication binds to the cell. So when you hear about pain receptors, you know, the pain meds and things like uh, sodium naproxen or uh, uh, Tylenol and those sorts of things uh, typically we find these as beta blockers and what they mean by that uh, is that it blocks where adrenaline is is uh, out and as a result you'll actually feel less pain because a lot of the pain receptors are being blocked and also adrenaline where you know you're getting the profuse sweating and all that those symptoms are uh, gone away and it has a lot to do with changing how the membrane uh, that holds certain things shape and charge as we talked about before I don't mean to beat it to death but we've talked a lot about that uh, and the similarities and this is how a lot of the pharmaceuticals work by antagonizing or blocking something and keeping the normal mechanisms from going in there and causing you uh, problems. So the membranes are just important uh, characteristics that we've talked about and just having the membranes. Notice there's this cholesterol ridden uh, grouping of those uh, proteins. You can see it riding around up here. It's nature's way of grouping similar functioning uh, proteins together. Sort of as a platter, you know, when a waiter brings uh, the drinks by and all that. Those are all associated with a particular customer at table. And that way we can kind of keep all the service uh, aspects of that uh, together. Nature does that using this uh, sort of little platter that floats around in the membrane and it's just amazing that these things uh, occur in nature like that and we can explain this fluid mosaic and then having a thickening as a result of cholesterol and other things providing that nice little raft effect isn't that amazing anyhow that's how nature does uh, what it needs to do so normal function of the cell can be disrupted uh, when cell membranes, particularly proteins embedded in them, don't function properly. Such malfunctions can cause health problems such as cystic fibrosis. Intentional disruption of normal cell membrane function can have beneficial therapeutic effects such as treatment of high blood pressure, anxiety, pain, that sort of thing. So uh, that is what's important. Now membranes also have uh, certain characteristics that uh, it has uh, receptors. Uh, this is CD4 markers that is well known associated with HIV. And one thing I'll try to drill in is like we're all suffering from this COVID-19 and it's all about that virus finding receptors. Now these are 
a little bit stranger receptors than we typically have seen with like the flu these tend to go well we don't really know uh, i want to go ahead and just say that uh, i've seen lots of papers about lots of possibilities of what's going on uh, lower respiratory but it seems to be associated uh, with an aspect of uh, a certain type of receptors that increase in number as you get older. So as you get older, you're more susceptible. Uh, conversely, the fewer those receptors, the least uh, 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 chances of getting sick uh, you, you become. So uh, I'll just tell you a word of uh, advice. You can always get your doctor's opinion, but you might see in a hospital, a lot of doctors will just start taking uh, zinc, you know, they just throw a pill in their mouth, you know, they're cheap, you can get them from Walgreens or any place, just good old zinc, and zinc, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately for the virus, but good for us, it tends to block a lot of the receptors that we typically see for flu and, and uh, various things, and they, there's some papers that have been stating that zinc uh, can help block some of those receptors for the COVID-19, uh, making it less likely to be affected. But if the whole idea is, just like a beta blocker, like we were just talking about, zinc can actually cover over some of these receptors that might be associated with HIV and, and that sort of thing. But the receptors are like dual purpose. They're not there just for uh, the possibility of binding HIV. No, HIV has stolen the, the blueprints for that particular receptor design. And it now takes uh, the approach of an anti whatever that receptor is, it fits it with a, like a hand in a glove. So wherever there's a positive charge, it's negative. If, it go, if the shape moves up, it moves in and moves out and moves over. And in other words, it's just like a key going into a lock and that very specific. So a lot of these receptors are used for other things and they're associated with the the big id card like when you go at wake tech you have your picture and you flip it over it's got barcodes and all sorts of things and it's a way to identify you it's the same sort of thing you think of it as these are your barcodes and the virus is coming in or whatever uh, will read the barcode and uh well the immune system will read the barcode and say is this part of us or not and we call that the major histocompatibility complex well the virus hijacks one of those uh, barcode areas and it's just a shape of charge you know a protein shape and it has a structure and function and in this case it's usually uh, utilized by the immune system that says are you uh, is this part of you or not if it's not we're going to destroy it if it is you, then we just leave it alone. That's recognized as what we call self. Anyhow, so a lot of these receptor types, everyone has them. All the humans of this particular would have major histocompatibility complex. There are some that have slightly different modifications that the viruses cannot bind to, and we find these uh, individuals. And there are cases of that for HIV. But anyhow, the idea is that uh, receptor, or that protein that's on the surface of the membrane, it reads like a barcode, and I wanted to point that out. It's part of the communications within the cell. And you think about it, we have 100 trillion cells. Out of all this, we got to know which cells are ours and which cells aren't ours. And this is one way we do that with the MHC, or the major histocompatibility. Now, what am I going to ask you on an exam is just know that we have types of cells that are used for identification. And that's why I threw the barcode. Everyone knows barcodes. and usually used in badges and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to uh, share that with you. Uh, that, uh, that, that thought. So every cell in your body has a fingerprint. It's made from a variety of molecules. And the one that you'll hear about if you ever go further into science, I hope you do, uh, in medicine, whatever, you'll hear a lot about major histocompatibility antigens and that sort of thing. It's used for uh, immune function. So uh, your immune system has to know. It's a check, uh, check and balance. If we have cells that aren't supposed to be there, then they need to be removed because uh, it's not part of uh, the mission. Our mission is to grow and be happy. So 
Uh, cells within proper fingerprints are recognized as foreign and will be attacked. So when you hear of someone with an autoimmune type of issue, that's essentially your immune system attacking your own cells or something in this communication that's not quite right and can happen. Um, so there's a very, very important aspect of this uh, having the ability to recognize self. That's why when you might have to have a, uh, an organ or something that because of a car accident or some uh, like hepatitis or something, uh, you might need a replacement organ, which is really, uh, you're asking a lot. A lot of times when somebody has been in a fatal accident and is our donor, then sometimes uh, there might be a match. What are they matching? the major histocompatibility antigens. As much as, it's never going to be a total match. They can handle with drugs, some of the mismatch. But for the most part, the closer together in terms of the profile of these major histocompatibility pro, uh, proteins, uh, you can do organ transfers and, and not have rejection. Rejection is an autoimmune response against, it flunked the are you uh, one of us uh, barcode tests and then it sends out the troops to get rid of you and you don't want to do that because this is a, it's a new organ that's going to save your life and so we have to use uh, uh, methods to modulate uh, some of the immune response which is dangerous in itself but uh, without the organ you, you may not be surviving so Anyhow, I just wanted to bring that up. So HIV, I brought it up uh, in the previous, we're going to talk more about it. But uh, we're talking about how things get transmitted far away. And most of the common methods involve uh, blood, semen, uh, vaginal fluid, breast milk from one individual to another. The HIV, now you don't have AIDS if you have the HIV virus. I just want to make that point. You could have a virus load, lots of HIV virus particles in your blood, but you don't have AIDS. What's really strange and to me ugly about this virus that it becomes truly a pathogen when it mutates and now can rec recognize yet another type of receptor. And that receptor of that type of cell, which the HIV virus will totally destroy, is the one in the immune system, they call it a helper cell, that helps it communicate with other uh, immune cells. You take out that main communicator then the body doesn't know what's going on and you can see why any infection you have will not be recognized because your ability to communicate within your immune system is shut down. And I just wanted to point that out because that is yet another important aspect of why we have these major histocompatibility antigens and this uh, sort of check and balance system. And this virus is so evil that it takes out the ability now uh, for helper cells to do what they need to do in order to create an immune response. Now you have AIDS. That is, by definition, immunodeficiency because you cannot raise and then you're essentially now susceptible to everything and a lot of times you find out if you take uh, other courses uh, but I'll mention it now is that your immune system is not only keeping other foreign agents out it also helps you uh, from uh, developing cancers of various types so when a cell becomes rogue in other words it's not following the rules and it's replicating too fast certain markers now appear and other proteins and recognition sequences for the immune system and they take it out. They ruin them and kill those uh, uh, precursor cancerous cells and that's one important aspect of our immune system. So we want a nice healthy immune system uh, to try to uh, offset these uh, insults that we get. And so uh, the you get before an HIV infection, then you get an acute HIV. Now they're just talking about the HIV virus itself. And so you'll get increasing numbers of uh, viruses perhaps. And so they always talk about sampling for viral load. And is it detectable or not? So weeks, months, years may go by and eventually you get increased numbers. Now the problem with that, it becomes statistical. And HIV is a uh, RNA virus. Uh, there's more to it than that, but RNA is single-stranded. You already know that. So now we're applying some of the things that we've already learned that single-stranded 
and double-stranded DNA, RNA, this is single-stranded, if there's a mutation that occurs, there's no way to fix it because there's no reference to what that was. And double-stranded, at least you have it's complementary to know what it was before it got damaged on the other strand. Well, RNA is not like that, so it tends to mutate more. See how his uh, it's just hideous this organism is this virus and then once you get the higher viral load then the probability of it mutating now to affect those helper cells now you have AIDS so I hope that helps your understanding about HIV uh, it's, it's just one of those things but it relates exactly what we're talking about with the receptors and I thought it was uh, a really good for your book to bring that up in this part so now, some of the jargon in here I'm not too worried about, but uh, I want you to at least uh, hear of it. The AIDS-causing HIV virus uses molecular markers on the cell plasma membranes. So these are the barcodes. That's one of the functions of things in our membranes that act as our IDs. And these same molecular markers are also the reason why it's... Uh, uh, why it's extremely unlikely for a person to catch AIDS from casual contact. Uh, but the specific markers involved in the infection belongs to a group of identifying calls clusters of differentiation. So it's a numbers game. That's all this is saying is you get enough of potential viruses coming in uh, and in locations that typically may not ever see, now that I'm talking about body locations, might see an assault uh, due to activities or various other things. And then the immune system might see these numbers of viruses and then uh, these markers like the CD1, CD2, CD3, or clusters of differentiation uh, become players because normally uh, individuals from handshaking or doing those sorts of things would never come in contact with these types of cells with these markers. You see what I'm saying? But if you go to other locations where it's not typical, but you introduce the virus in those locations, now it has something to dock to and the virus. The viruses can't do anything uh, because they can't replicate on their own. They have to have you. They're pirates. Think of as viruses as pirates and they have to take over a ship in order to sail where they need to go and uh, otherwise uh, they're inert. That's why a lot of people argue are viruses alive or not. Well, it's your definition of what's alive, but a virus is really infectious uh, nuclear material, uh, DNA or RNA, never both. It's either one or the other. And um, HIV, just to show how hideous HIV is, it actually uh, is an RNA virus, but it has an enzyme that kind of breaks the central dogma theory that it can actually take RNA to DNA. So it brings the enzyme to the party with it in the virus. And I have a model of this. I 3D printed this model. I usually show it in class, but uh, you can look at pictures of this nasty virus. If you're interested, I'd be glad to show you, and I have handouts for that that you're welcome to look at if this is of interest to you. But uh, the, the HIV is, is, can, can do a lot of things with this single strand of RNA, and one of them is mutate. And when it mutates, there's a probability now it's going to recognize this helper cell as receptor, and then uh, the story now changes to AIDS. And I just wanted to point that out, but it's, it's uh, so germane to this uh, uh, part of what we're talking about. So the CD marker called CD4 is found on cells deep within the body. See what I'm saying? Typically you don't see like in in uh, different cell types in various other regions that would, in casual contact would never happen. HIV targets the CD4 in the conjunction with other receptors, other CD types, and uh, these HIV particles uh, even though they may be huge numbers on other surfaces, but if they get in contact with the CD4s, that's where we run into the problems. And I just wanted to communicate that because, you know, I, I'm trying really hard throughout the series of stuff that we talk about to relate it to things that you're aware of or hopefully, you know, want to know more about just to be on the safe side or, or guard yourself. Uh, that's that's part of my job, I think, is to, to relate it to things that you can understand as we go through this. And you'll remember these concepts that we're talking about more. And then, of course, you want to become a doctor or a veterinarian or something. And glad to have you on board. 
So every cell in your body has a fingerprint made from a variety of cell of mo molecules on the outside facing of the cell membrane. This molecular fingerprint is key to the function of your immune system. So I think I've worn you out on this topic of membranes, uh, but we still have a little bit more to go. And I'm going to save that for part four uh, for this series. And I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion if you have questions. Uh, I'm going to be trying something new, uh, so be looking forward to maybe uh, answering some questions inside a film or a, a video or uh, maybe one dedicated for just that. We'll see how that goes. But uh, stay well and I'll see you uh, next time.